If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 Sending out good vibes. 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 Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. Coming at you this week with the uh, past guests and I'm sure fan favorite, John C. Dvorak of No Agenda fame. Uh, of course, we've always had this weird big audience crossover with No Agenda. I mean, they were always way bigger than us, obviously, but it seems like we were both kind of coming up still in different. They were still growing big time when we came up. So and we were. Graham became a knight, so we produced some shows, and we just ended up with just a, a huge crossover between us and the No Agenda guys, which has been great. We ended up on their stream all the time. We're always on the No Agenda live stream in different parts, and uh, it's been great for us. So it's great to have John on the show. We got everybody's favorite podcaster, Godly Graham Dunlop. <laughs> I don't want to talk too much because John, you know, doesn't like just rambling of the hosts for too long. So there is a timestamp to the interview if you don't want to listen to our intro here and our, our lazy ramblings. Um, actually, just thinking about that, I don't think I have a full bio, bio ready for JCD, but I don't think we really need one for that. Um, but yeah, he, I'm surprised how many listeners, actually. I really appreciate the listeners that uh, that donated to No Agenda would give us a shout-out, like my America shout-out. I mean, I really think that showed that, like, we did have, uh, we did play a part in some of their, uh, in their producers, you know? They they would say, hey, we, I got here from Grand America, and that was always mm-hmm. awesome to hear. Grand America donations. And they really have changed the landscape of, uh, of news media deconstruction. I mean, I really do think they do a really good job at the deconstruction, despite sort of having to put up with the mainstream media lies as they deconstruct. But, you know, I think it's changed the way I look at things. I think it's changed the way millions of people look at things, you know, look at it at the deeper level. Uh, plus they both come from the media atmosphere. So they, they know how things are tailored to suit a certain narrative and how things are actually produced that way. Like, you know, I, I don't think you can see it. If you don't, if you don't come from that media background, you don't realize how pre-produced it is. Exactly. And they just do theirs. Like he says on the fly, right. They just do. And we do that too. I mean, we don't, but, but ours isn't really like the same type of show as theirs, but um, they, it's a performance art is what he called it. There you have it. Of course, we do have we do have our roundup, our weekly roundups over at Grand America Outlaw, where we kind of do something similar to what they're doing. We play some clips, read some news, read some articles, and uh, go through some studies. You know, like deconstruct some studies. Yeah, kind of the lazy ramblings with purpose, yeah. and with some clips. Yeah. So we've been doing that over there. It's not easy to do, and uh, they do a great job over there. So how's the coast there, Elon lover? Well, I mean, it's raining. It's The snow's gone and it's raining. It's just really dark and rainy here, but that's okay. I mean, I'll probably be coming home fairly soon, I think. Uh, just, it's just got lots of work here to do too, and, you know, uh, it's okay. Rain yeah. gets old fast out there. It, it does, dark and rainy. <laughs> Totally. Once you've I mean, been in Alberta for a while and you go back to that, I don't, you know, it's dude, different. The, it's the different. sun is up every day. I mean, I noticed that when I moved to Calgary, I was like, oh my God, the sun rises and sets every day. Cause it would be like socked in layer upon layer of gray for weeks. And in, in, in certain parts of Vancouver, not every part is, is like that, but a lot of parts are. Yeah, exactly. That's a, like, it wasn't that bad where I'm home. It's not as cloudy where I grew up, but it was still like cloudy where you could literally go a week without seeing the sun. Yeah. And maybe not even notice it. Like here they, now, it's if it's cloudy for like three days, I'm like, geez, is yeah, totally. the sun. This is getting yeah. old. Yeah. 
Sometimes minus 40 and sunny, but yeah. So I'm trying to sell my car too, actually. If if anybody's interested in a Lexus, I this is sort of funny. It's, John, the it's the, it's it, the John C. Dvorak. Uh, he loves the Lexus, the old Lexus, but this is a 2012 and uh, it's Are you trying a to new sell your car in the show right now. Are you used sure. car salesman in the show? I, yeah, I mean, why not? If somebody's interested in an all wheel drive, it's a great snowmobile, it's snow car, like it's, it's uh-huh. great in the ice and snow. It's got all wheel drive. I mean, of course, the clearance is low. It's a sports car that's like 304 horsepower. It's got a new engine with 167,000 kilometers only on this new used engine. And it's got a whole bunch of other, should I read the, I should read my ad really, because I, like I had a bite, I put it on last night. Like what, what? Nobody is buying your car for the podcast. Right? Why not? If somebody's looking for it, I mean, why not? Maybe, or maybe if somebody is a car nut and they like to, like I if there's somebody that car. can afford, car, it's a Lexus all wheel drive. It's, it's, it's a beautiful How car. How many miles? So it's got 167,000 kilometers on the new used engine. The car in total has like 303,000. And it's uh let's blow it up got, with Canarite and maybe we could get enough views. No, dude, dude, I need this money really bad. Like I, I, I sunk 11,000 into this to get the thing running. And now I can't have two now cars and need to, to get rid of a thousand bucks. <laughs> I yeah, basically. Oof. Cause there's none of these on the market. I mean, it's a good, and it's got a new engine. It's got a new high pressure fuel pump. It's got a new fuel pump in the tank and a relay, new injector harness, new high pressure fuel injectors, a new fuel pump computer module, new battery, new front brakes, new rear brakes, rotors and pads, repaired calipers, new front and rear struts, new air filters, cleaned out radiator, extra set of winter tires. There's a hitch there for a bike rack, and a bike rack is included as well. I mean, all that. I mean, all that for twelve thousand five hundred Canadian dollars. Is it the little mini, little mini insert on the bike rack? I might want the bike rack. It is, yeah, yeah. It's well, not full size one, right? That'll go in my truck. Yeah. So insert. honestly, it it can really help a help a brother out here. I I uh, I need that brother. to sell it so much. I put eleven. I put it, bro. You know. Bro, you're not bro, a brother. Bro. Help a brother out. <laughs> Do you identify as a black man? Uh, dude, I don't think of brothers being black. I mean, uh, what about the bra thing? It's just short for brother. Bra right? is different. That's not brother. Oh, brother okay, definitely. Bro. Help a bra. Definitely. Help a bro. What about bro? Bro? Bro is okay. Bro's okay. Okay. Kinda help a bro douchey. out then. Help, help a bro, a bro out. out. That's kind of douchey, but that's yeah. okay. Brother is definitely black insinuation, though. I mean, so anyways, I mean, I really have to get, get rid of this thing. So I put it up and I had somebody bite right away, but he doesn't, he doesn't want it yet. It's so I'm still, I'm, I got to put another ad up tonight. So I might as well talk about it on the show in case there's some Lexus fans out there. Somebody might want to buy it. Well, before you buy the car, support the show. Grandamerica.ca. <laughs> so we will talk about that a little bit later. You know, support's down. It's at an all time low for the Grand America show. You know, it's just kind of sad. Maybe you guys don't like it anymore, but. I think you do. The downloads are going up, if anything, not down. So there's more people supposedly listening to the show than ever. Less people support. That's unacceptable. Maybe you guys could fix that. You know, you don't have to donate every episode, maybe every 10, maybe every 50, whatever you can afford, maybe a buck a month. A buck a month is only like three or four cents a day. You know, a nickel a day, buck 50 a month. I think we can make that happen. If everyone did that, we wouldn't, we would stop talking about it. If everyone could donate, a buck or two a month, we wouldn't have to ask. But uh, we're not there yet. It's about 1%. So, grammarica.ca slash support. Guys, if you're getting some value from the podcast, just do remember it's not a free podcast. It's a value for value podcast where we create it and put it all out there into the world for free in the hopes that those who do find some value in it will send some value back our way at grammarica.ca slash support. Sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation today. Um, you know, it's getting to the point where it's going to be costing us money to put this show again. That's a, it's got to be at least somewhat financially viable. It's got to at least pay its own expenses. So yeah, exactly. Expenses are yeah. going up and support is going down. Yeah. And the problem, the problem is it's, it's not just people like, it's not like the people are deleting their thing, but there's a, there's a, there's a uh, attrition rate that happens, not because people are leaving, but because PayPal shuts people off and people's credit cards expire. Like there's a natural sort of, Attrition that happens. No, oh no, churn. sorry, I shouldn't say oh, natural. It's, it's it's an what? The churn rate. It's a churn. It's a churn. Yeah, yeah. It's not natural. It's uh, I don't know. We don't know why PayPal does it, but it's hard to 
It's hard to just email people all the time stripes and say, hey. Worse. I swear Stripe's worse. Really? Well, it's at least as bad. Because yeah. the only two games in town, though. So Yeah. So. Here we are, at your mercy. So we got other ways, too. We got audiobooks. We got a few audiobooks out. There's an awesome... There's an awesome dystopia, utopia, steampunk kind of fiction book from Ignatius Donnelly called Caesar's Column. It's on our podcast. It's like, what, 10 hours and something? It's yeah, fantastic. It's almost 11. The Divine Pymander of Hermes. Tris Magistus is in our podcast now. Um, Fabianism and the Empire, a manifesto by the Fabian Society. Um, there's also 25 essential tales that define vampire lore. This is going back to like 1800s, 1900s, the, the world's earliest vampire chronicles. There's 25 tales about vampires. Rudolf Steiner, Christianity as Mystical Fact and the Mysteries of Antiquity is also new on our audiobook podcast. So lots uh, to do there too. That's at uh, adultbrain.ca, right? Tons of stuff. Tons of great stuff. Yeah, adultbrain.ca or adultbrain.ca. Audiobooks, if you just want to search in your podcast player, it does by uh, amount of titles. I'm pretty sure it's the biggest audiobook podcast in the world. So, And there's more coming all the and time. There's more coming all the time. So you're going to come back home, Tesla boy? Yeah. How'd the Tesla do the next day? Because we listened to No Agenda cover the same thing I did. I didn't know that at the time. I did want to mention that when I played that clip, I hadn't listened to No Agenda yet. I, yeah. The Tesla thing. I was he I was said, expecting them to deconstruct it a bit more, to be honest. Yeah. We did though. So anyway, the next day you had Tesla problems again, did you? Yeah, well it just it just was just losing losing charge fairly fast and you had to had to go out of the way to charge it. Because they mentioned the thirty percent Tesla supercharger thing, but uh, you were having problems at home, weren't you? Even charging yeah, yeah, at home. Yeah. The supercharger, the, but there was one time he charged it. He tried to. He thought it was charging in the supercharger, and it wasn't. So now I don't know wh- whose fault that was. If it was the supercharger's fault, or if it was the, you know, I think it was because the, he just tried another one and it worked. So he just. You know, that's why I said it was more of an infrastructure thing than the battery thing, because he's he's had no problems charging it uh, at the supercharger. Cold. What? So it got cold. No, no, no. Then it still oh. charges okay. They don't run out. They don't run out. Like there was that. And when the No Agenda guys played that clip, there was that thing about uh, oh, it's it's not going to charge under thirty percent unless you precondition it or something. There was some weird. And that's I don't think that's true. That's why I think it's a hit job on Elon. Elon, they don't like what Elon's doing on X right now. On, on what? pushing back on X on Twitter. Yeah. He just refused to not call it Twitter, huh? I don't well, know. I, I've I'd been like, on it since it was X. I've only like been on it since it was X. About uh, yeah, getting someone out. How would I do that? Let's ask listeners to like. Maybe everybody should email in or report. All right, here, let's start the Great Gramerica, uh Twitter reinstatement, reinstatement program. Email Twitter, yeah. contact Twitter any way you can. Maybe at them on Twitter at Elon. Let's, Wherever Let's you make can. An, uh, make an op out of it. Operation Operation X reinstatement. No, no. No, I won't be a part of it unless it's Twitter. Oh, Operation Twitter. Twitter. I've never been on it as X. So as far as I'm concerned, X is not even a thing. <laughs> and I've only been on it since X. Yeah. That's it. That's and you're weird, the man. official tranny of the show. So Not uh, tranny, yeah. sorry. That's not the right word. You're the official drag queen of the show. We should have so made it official be? that you had to dress up as a drag queen if you won. Operation Twitter re-up, maybe? Yes. I like that one. And then whoever gets us back on gets a free lifelong subscription. So what do people have to do to get... That's a good one. I like that. If somebody gets Darren back on Twitter, we'll give them... Yeah, free like lifelong subscription, subscription to everything. And, uh, yeah. Audiobooks, yeah. all the podcasts we do. Oh, right, everything, everything. yeah. The everything. Full meal deal. Graham will uh, send you a calendar of the 12 months of Graham. The 12 calves of Graham. I the found an old calf, calf pick the other day. Did you when you were still yeah. jacked? Yeah. It was calves must wild. be more jacked now that you're carrying around an extra 50. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what How's do they have to part? do? So what do people have I to do? just got to get me back on Twitter. That's so it. How, I don't okay, know so what how do they? Do because I can't get me back on Twitter. So, okay, but I'm here's what John's... 
but John suggested you get somebody else to do it. So, so the appeal, what are you, what are you saying? I think is to get somebody go through the appeal process for you because uh, you've been, you know, blacklisted or I'll, I'll go it out. So do people go to the appeal process and say that get dry America? Like what was your old handle at well, dry America? I put it in and ask what handle it pertains to. And you have to put in at dry America. So you might already be in the box then, you know what I mean? Well, no, maybe it's coming from a different IP or a different... Uh, yeah, because I've tried it from like a bunch of different IPs and even when I was in America. But I think I don't know. I don't think I can suggest the best way to do it. You could try that appeal way. Maybe you could ap appeal through a different account. Maybe you could appeal through a fake account. Uh, just an at, hey, somebody please read this or something like that. But I can't get through. I've been trying for a year and a bit now and it's an auto response within like... 20 or 30 minutes minutes of me asking if I can. It's uh, No one's there reading the emails that fast. It's definitely an AI program I'm stuck in. I think John's right. It's a bit of code that that no one knows how to get to and no one knows it's even a problem. So just get me back on Twitter and you win. That's it. You'll be uh, you'll be the hero of the day. In what, what was your actual, it was at just at Gramerica? That at was it? America. Okay, so super easy to remember. And I'm just looking for a way. Like, isn't there a way you can podcast? It was at Grand American was just Darren the Welder. If you go back to the original few posts, it's just me talking about the flames and welding stuff. And then you went down the, the path of... Uh, and I went alt-right. I got the, caught up in a bad <laughs> crowd. You went there. What's the, what's the word? There's a word for it. You were... You were um, I was... Uh, yeah, what's that word really? when they... You were radicalized. I was radicalized. Yeah. By podcasts. Yeah. And now I'm on the government list and I'm subversive. And it's just, I don't understand how this happened. What have you done to me, Graham? Yeah. It seems like you've gone in the other direction. I know it is. It's very strange. We're sort of swapping, swapping shoes here. That's it. Swapping shoes. So it's warm here again. I was hunting pheasants the other day. Got to shoot at some pheasants. Seen there's a, at least six pheasants living on my property. Wow. So that's like my little weekend thing. Now I, get killing them out? Just... I haven't got one yet. Pheasants are hard to hunt without a dog, especially mm. now in the snow because they sent tend to say roosted. And the ones that are alive in the winter, these are the ones that are, you know, they're like uh, the clever ones. They seem to be roosting in trees, which is weird for pheasants. So I'll get one eventually. I mean, I'm not like gung ho because I don't want all the pheasants to be gone either. You know what I mean? I go out for an hour in the morning. Well, yeah, that's the, the thing. You don't want to just kill all the. No, I'm gonna try and see if I can buy a bunch in the spring and release them. So you think you could find God and become like Father Graham before September? Or... No, no. Rabbi Graham? No. Can we just make our own religion? I mean, what's that work? Let's just yeah, that's like Graham America religion, right? I mean, you're the Father Graham America. That's creepy. Father of America, yeah. Hmm. Anyway. So you're not stopping through anyway back? You're just flying straight over? I, I don't know. I might be if this car doesn't sell. I might have to pick it up in Calgary. So it's it, the, the car, car the car is in Calgary. It's an IS three fifty. What car's in Calgary now? Twenty twelve black IS three fifty with an extra set of tires and yeah. You can park it here if you want. If you don't want to bring it to Saskatchewan. It might be easier to sell in Calgary, but I mean, I don't want to burden you right. with the administrative part about showing people the car and taking ten percent, bitch. Stuff. Yeah, I can't take ten percent because that's like more than you're gonna make. <laughs> I'm not making. I'm not looking to make anything. I just looking you're to. Gonna make I, you're just looking to break even. I just want. I just need to sell it. That's all. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. it sounds desperate. It's probably not the best. You know. That sounds kind of desperate because he's not coming from a strong negotiating position. <laughs> I'm broke really bad and I need to sell it. Like ever since Amazon kicked us off, it's been a it's been a steady like climb back up to where we were and it's it's been a tough ride. It has been a tough ride, but we're getting I'm, there. I'm not uh pulling any punches. We're like uh, halfway there. We're halfway halfway back to where we were with audiobooks. So I'm get I'm looking for that's why I'm on the coast working and I gotta work when I get back to Saskatoon to find other jobs, working all day, all night, whatever it takes. Podcasting like a motherfucker. All right. Do you have a did you find a bio for Mr. Dvorak? I mean, no, I mean has, I, I just get a 
say he's like, well, no, we, we got to talk about the eclipse first because oh, I mean, you know, this is at, this is in Adam's territory, but he I won't go. Eh? Come, he won't come. No. Yeah. I mean, I should we I advertise ain't. it on the show on no agenda? I don't think he cares about that. He's just like, I personally am protecting my property. <laughs> Cause <laughs> he, is he, if I was in the middle of it, I wouldn't leave my shit. Is he in the path of totality? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He probably literally lives within like 45 minutes of the bros. Wow. In a couple of minutes, like half an hour where we're doing the You should have to like a meet up in his like front yard. Like if there were here going over my place, I wouldn't leave here because you just get weirdos all over the place that'll just like, who knows, set up shop. If you're like not there for a few days, you could come back to people camping on your shit. Yeah. And it's not even before the eclipse. It's after the eclipse when you're stuck in traffic where people start making crazy desperate decisions. So food for thought, but uh, we are doing the clips. You would contact at the cabin.com, hit the menu up at the bottom at the top. I mean, and uh, there'll be a link right there for clips at the Canyon. We're going to be having a time down there with the brothers of the serpent and Ben and Dave Madison and all these people. We're going to be partying, playing some music from the $50 dynasty and uh, watching total solar eclipse event of a lifetime. I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, if you guys like the lazy ramblings, we've cut them short here and there, but we do the roundup. That's 40, you know, basically 45 or 50 minutes for free every week of us just lazily rambling, but with a little more purpose in here yeah. and laughing at uh, the news and yeah, idiots, the Canadian government, which seems to be falling apart at a rapid pace. So you're not doing a bio then? Well, oh no, yeah, he's just, I mean, he is, he's the old tech guy, right? He's the old tech guy. He used to write for a bunch of tech magazines and stuff and, and pub, what are they called? PC Periodicals mag. or publications and PC bag. You know, he's the guy that didn't think the mouse was going to be successful. Is that the story? Yes, that is so the story. Those people said, making comments no in the chats about the, about the mouse. mouse. Yeah. And anyways, he's uh, the ho- co-host of No Agenda, of course, the best podcast in the universe. I have no problem admitting that. Um, and he's also co-host of DH Unplugged. And he got kicked off of, uh, I mean, I think he got, we should have talked to him about that. I mean, maybe we did on the original show way back when, but he was uh, he was working uh, still as a, as a journalist. Um, and uh, I don't know what Darren's showing me something here, but <laughs> I can't really see it. You're trying DB, to show me so this camera. is from the sun. Someone sent me this from the sun. Okay. DB Cooper's identity will finally be revealed after bombshell DNA breakthrough. Oh, that's fascinating. Wow. Okay. That that's is good. fascinating because so, the inside scoop tells me that we got the guy. We've got the first and probably only interview kicking around on the internet with him right now. Mm-hmm. And he just happens to be coming back on our other podcast later this week. Yeah. Grand America a lot later, later this week. So, John, that whole DB Cooper thing could still blow up for us. Oh yeah, total. Oh, totally. Yeah, that John, five thousand dollars might not be a total loss. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, there's another thing. I mean, you know, we just flew ourselves to half, you know, in the back east somewhere to try and you know interview some some guys with uh, Brandon Powell and at our own expense, of course, but. Yeah, maybe that'll pay off in the end. Anyways, uh, John was kicked off. What was he? What was he? Who was he working for when he got booted out? Twitch for talking about five G. Or it was like that Leo Laporte show. The uh, the Twitter was like, wasn't it Twitch? No, 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 no. He was writing for Twitch, somebody the at the time. Oh, that was I don't know. I don't know, but that was because really- he because he, he wrote like one article on five G, and I don't think they liked it. Then he wrote another one on five G, and uh, oh yeah, that was naughty, naughty, and he got kicked off. So. Now I think he's just podcasting. And he writes of he's got a Substack too. An awesome Substack. Absolutely. So I don't know what to do. Substack, no agenda. If you guys haven't heard it, I mean check out our Rick McCoy episode. It's there in the back out. I don't have the number in front of me, but if you just Google Grammarica Rick McCoy or DB Cooper, it'll come right up. And uh, it's an amazing chat with Rick. It really is something fantastic. We'll have another good one this week. For now. You guys just enjoy this great chat with the one and only John C. Bora.
Well, welcome back, John, to Grime America. How's it going today? Good. It's Good. raining. We're getting Good. some rain finally. Unlike you guys, who just get nothing but rain. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we've you've been. It's been requested that you do the whole show in your Canadian accent. Oh, <laughs> you know, I could try, but I'm not sure that I can get pull it off for a whole hour. Hey, hey, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so John is, uh, you know, famous from the No Agenda show. Uh, we like to, we'll talk about mainly that. I mean, we don't need to to see other stuff. We want to promote your show you know, on here. We talk about it enough, and we have a bunch of people that listen. You to know, your I also had the DHM show. plug show that could be use a little plug. True, true. How's that but one going? No Agenda is the plug pluggable show. Yeah. How, how's how's the DH going? It's it's doing well. We uh, it's been, we've been doing that for over a decade. Keeps me a. Uh, kind of keeps me uh, in the uh, financial side, kind of, so I'm not just forgetting everything. I used to right. write for Barons and Smart Business and some of these financial publications, and I uh, also I think well, there was another one, and um, I didn't want to. Oh yeah, I worked I wrote for Forbes for a couple of years, so I didn't want to completely lose touch with that. Just in, I don't know, it, it's you need to keep up. So what are you guys saying right now? Is there going to be a collapse? Is there is there a no? Nope, we don't think bubble? so. No, eh? no. The only people that think about collapses are people trying to get headlines, get going for clicks. Uh, if there's going to be a collapse, it'll be after they put Trump in. I think you know Adam and I are convinced that they're setting Trump up for the collapse. They're just let let things get ruined and put Trump in and let him take the heat for it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it and makes him handle it. Homeless, uh, immigration, everything, you know, make him deal with it. Yeah, that's a good point. So, it so in that in that in that theory, you kind of want it, they want him to be in, I guess. Well, I don't think they. I think they're getting to the or coming to the conclusion that they uh, they won't be able to cheat hard enough. They won't be able to cheat right. They, I mean, the two sides are going to cheat, and so one of them can't cheat enough, and so uh, and Biden, you know, is. is there's still people that don't think he's even going to be on the ticket. So what about housing? Like, would you, would you recommend if somebody had, could afford a down payment for a house these days, even in an inflation inflated market like Vancouver or BC, would you, would you recommend uh, getting into that? My recommendation is to always get into real estate. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, unless you, you got suckered or so you don't buy a Brooklyn bridge or anything like that, but buy real estate. Yeah. Even so, like the city centers and and stuff like that, or do you think I'm it's sorry. safer? To, do you think it's safe in the safer in the city centers and like a city like, say like a San Francisco or something like that? After the guess. after the whole thing collapses, but not right now. Not right now, yeah. But like it a rural like, setting, it looks, like, it looks like a scam. It looks like they're trying to set up these cities so they pretty much collapse and op, uh, offer these real estate opportunities. Uh, that'll be buy low, sell high kind of thing. Uh, it, it, it's a known fact that people have been doing this to get into real estate cheaper. You screw up the place. That's kind of exactly what our entire country feels like right now. I mean, anything within an hour of a major city or an hour and a half of a major city is so inflated that you're paying, you know, 70 grand, 80 grand a year in interest when you start out. Yeah, you have to... Uh... You have to pick your place. So how have you seen that, that before we get into the no agenda side of things, how have you seen that sort of side of things change over the last 40 years? Has it stayed pretty steady with the real estate side of things? Has it after the collapse in 2008 and sort of this weird stock market blips. thing? Those collapses are so short lived. It's ridiculous. Uh, real estate is just, has been, my entire life has been the best investment you could make. The thing that makes it super valuable is the fact that it's leveraged. Unlike, you know, you buy stocks, you know, you can't, you can buy some stocks on margin, but it's a pretty minor, uh, the leveraging is minor compared to real estate, which can be, uh, the leverage can be as much as uh, 90%. You can 10% down in some situations. You can take out this huge mortgage and just start paying it off. And it, the real estate value continues to rise. It's just a super winner. I mean, I bought a place. The first uh, real estate I bought was in 72. And uh, I got a house 
uh, in a near San Francisco for $22,000 in 1972. <laughs> that same place today is worth $1.2 million. And so, yeah, there's a couple of ups and downs, but 22000 to $1.2 million in one piece of property, where it, and you leverage it. So my down payment was like 2500 to maximum. It was... Um, it wouldn't have been over four thousand dollars, but I think it was like two or twenty five hundred. I can't yeah. remember it's a while ago. But that that kind of leverage, so you're basically investing twenty five hundred dollars, paying rent for all practical purposes, which would be the mortgage, would be about the same price as rent. So for twenty two hundred dollars, you walk away with one point two million bucks. I mean, come on. Even even though it's been fifty years. Well, fifty years is fifty years, but you know that's a, that one point two million. If you it, say it stayed there, that's like a retirement. Uh, it's a nice b- lot of money, and you can yeah. also take money out as you go along. You can probably yeah. pull out, you know, half a million and spend it. I, I mean, it's just real estate is just a winner. Well, plus in, in plus in that case that you're not mortgage broke. I mean, it's 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 small enough that as you go on through the years, it'll be paid off. I mean, oh, yeah, no, that's, off and, yeah, yeah. That, but of course, I did sell it and bought something else. But yeah, the uh, it's like you, that's what you do. Yeah, and you ratchet. Up. So even so, regardless of whether you're going to live in there or not, like if it's a live-in place or or an investment, you still like like real estate. It's also pretty cool in California that they they freeze the property taxes. So when you move into a place, you, the property tax is set and they can't raise it more than just a few points. They can't just jack it up like they do in Washington State and other places. So anyway, that's my investment advice, especially to young people who can't afford, quote unquote, can't afford it. But they can if they scrimp. I mean, you anyone can scrimp for like, I'd say five up to five years. You should be able to put, put, put something together. Yeah. Um, I've advised people on doing that. And they, they, you always, once you're in, you're in because it's just, it, as it goes up, you're in. And yours is going up and whatever else goes up, you know, you can jump to something else and try to maximize everything. All right. I hope you don't mind if we get into a little bit of inside baseball about podcasting and stuff. I mean, I'm sure people would want to know a little bit about that. But I mean, I do sort of have some some overall questions like about the landscape of the whole podcasting market. Like what do you think of it nowadays, how it's changed for, for not just you guys, but for everybody. I mean, it has kind of shifted quite a bit. I think it's out of control. There's, there's, you know how many podcasts there are out there over 4 million. Yeah. Yeah. So every Tom, Dick and Harry's doing a podcast, you know, everybody on television's got one or two podcasts. Yeah. I mean, every celebrity, every news anchor. I mean, it's, well, I guess the main anchors don't have one, but I don't know that's to be true. But I, every time I hear uh, some analysis of something, say, oh, well, yeah, you should you see Jesse's podcast. You know, he's got a podcast. So so there's a lot of podcasts out there. And I, I, I don't think uh, very many of them are doing that well and could continue forever. Uh, they, they implement, uh, some of them can, I, I'm very surprised by some of them who do very well all the time. Uh, but it, it, it's a lot of factors involved. We do ours as a value for value, which we developed as a, as a way of making money and it's worked out for our podcast, but other people don't take it seriously enough. So they, it's not everyone's cup of tea to ask for, uh, support. Yeah. Uh, in fact, some people can't even do it. They can't do yeah. it. They literally can't ask for support. They just be it's beneath them. And that's what they help what they tell you. Oh, it's beneath me. Okay. Well, good. Starved to death. I don't mean it's, I don't know, it's beneath you. I have to have advertisers. Dude, the yeah. advertising thing is even grosser. It's even grosser. And it's not even the dog food one that you guys read on the show the other day. I mean, that is just pathetic. That's pathetic. But even I forget what I was listening to the other day. I think it it wasn't Tim Pool. It was something, but it was like a decent, you know what it was? It was Canada Lab. I was listening to Canada Lab. And it's like, it's not even like a, it's not even a degrading ad read because he's just reading about a mattress. It's like a, it's probably a decent mattress. And they gave him a free mattress, but just listening yeah. to him read it, it sounds pathetic. It's degrading well, just listening to it. I'd rather ask for money than read that fucking ad. It's gross. It sounds it sounds just as bad. I don't see how people think that sounds better than asking for money. Well, well, I mean, my it, new it, mattress, I've never slept so good. Blah, blah, blah. Don't you think? 
Yeah, bull crap. So my opinion has always been that, and I worked for Mevio for like a long time, and we did a lot of people's pie, or we had people producing podcasts left and right. And there's this thing amongst advertisers that, you know, it's better if it's called a host red ad. And the host is, you know, supposedly will sell better if he, you know, I've bought this mouse. And this is the best mouse I've ever owned. And they, you know, they read the ad, and it's a host read ad. And it's supposed to be better than a produced ad, which, in my opinion, is the way it should go. I mean, I, th- I think a, somebody produces their own an ad with a professional announcer and all the rest is going to have a better sales angle than a host read ad. But no, 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 they don't think that way. Uh, this is a comp. These things are faddish. They want for because some guys can do them well, and I will say, for example, I worked for uh, Leo Laporte forever at the uh, Twit, and Adam and I both agree that the only reason that network and his shows are successful is because Leo is one of the great ad readers. He's like a professional ad reader, and he can do what you what Darren what you just said. Uh, he can talk about the the getting the best night's sleep ever and sound like he means it. The number of people that are not professional in the <laughs> business that can pull that off. I don't know any, the guy was in broadcasting his whole life, so he can do that stuff. But most people aren't, have never been in broadcasting. They've never taken a, even a course at a school or they, they're just, you know, hacks. And so uh, the quality shows. Well, I think it's the authenticity that that they think is going to be like. I'd well, rather have you know a cold. You got it made. You'd have a cold read from somebody you respect that like really believes in the product, and you kind of think it's it's real, or and maybe it's. Uh, I think that's what they're thinking. But the other the other thing is, I I, di- I didn't want to ask for money either, but I I don't think it was because it was beneath me. I think it's just that I had a hard time asking. I don't really know why. I guess because <laughs> it's the, beneath in the beginning. You. And maybe it was you guys, because we listened to you almost right from the start of our show. And maybe it was like listening to you guys that actually get, sort of uh, helped us get well, the balls to get the balls to start asking. Well, I've always told uh, people one of the reasons that, you know, early on, we like we've been doing it for 16 years, uh, going on 17. And I remember like I can go back a decade or say 12 years ago and we we're talking. I, I talked to people about it. I said, well, the problem that most of the value for value um, podcasters have is the way they, they don't ask for money sincerely. It's like, like a, Oh, you know, if you can afford it, you know, give us an extra dime. If you get a nickel, you know, instead of seriously asking for money. And that means often uh, scolding people for not giving <laughs> any money, which is the trick. And that's a hard thing to do because it's like you get, you get even from your own family you'll get you can't talk to people that way and uh, no you can't talk to people that way because that's what uh that's in fact the way that most of the uh solicitors for donations that's the way they all act churches do it they scold the parishioners they're not they, they, you don't see people walking out in church when the uh, pastor or the whoever it is says, "Hey, you know, uh, we're not getting enough," uh, in, you know, can you up the ante a little bit? Maybe uh, cough up a little bit more, like a nickel, a dime, a dollar. Uh, you don't see people go, "Oh, this is terrible." He's asking me for this extra money. Forget it. I'm out of here. And then they hit the road. That doesn't happen. Um, no. Instead, the basket comes around, and and you have to be if you don't want to chip in. It's pretty obvious because you got to pass the basket by without chipping. Yeah. In. Well, well, you, well you, there's ways around that. You can usually the bat. Usually there's Just envelopes. It, yeah. There's always the envelope. You can put nothing in the envelope. Just put it in there, and you're good to go. Uh, Just put God bless in there or something. Yeah, you, know? I, you could do that, but most people don't. I, um, myself and my son, we used to visit it just just to check them out some mega churches and mega churches are fascinating and uh i always toss in five bucks after you know just to have the to for the knowledge that i gain from visiting a mega church and going through their system uh i don't have a problem giving throwing five bucks in there because uh or more five bucks usually but 
it's not a big deal. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of uh, spendable income and they don't mind. I mean, some people give us a thousand dollars, two thousand. We've gotten five, and it's not like uh, somebody else can't, you know, is going to get irked because we call them out for not even giving us a dollar. We have a, which is most people. Um, so it, it takes a little getting used to the techniques and the uh, and the fundamentals of fundraising, like this sort of fundraising. Once you, you get you, used to it, 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 it it's pretty good. Do you find the market itself, like the podcasting market? You mentioned millions of podcasts now. Everybody's got a podcast, literally. Everybody, literally. everybody that's been in TV already has a podcast. Do you think that it's it's saturated from the point of view that uh, people that uh, are going to listen to podcasts have already found it? And like, especially with your show, because you are strictly a podcast. You're not just on all these video platforms. So no. if somebody's not going to find you on a video platform. Have you sort of, do you, th- you feel like you've tapped that market of people that are going to get a podcast app and f- find the podcast and use that technology as opposed to just watching it on Facebook X or Rumble or YouTube or? No, not at all. I think the market is uh, in its infancy. And we just got started a long time ago because, you know, Adam Curry invented podcasting for all practical purposes. I mean, yeah, they, he, he feels obliged to share this, this uh, accolade with uh, Dave Weiner who had something to do with it. But in fact, Adam Curry invented podcasting and he's the one to take Who's personally taken it to the next level with podcasting 2.0, which is a big deal that is not recognized. I always tell him that I'm going to, he should be getting the, the Nobel prize peace prize for this. Um, and I'm serious. He should actually, but so so we I we're in very early. And I also was podcasting before I even ran into uh, uh, Adam when I was doing podcasts with uh, Leo. I <clears throat> probably worked on his show for a year before I started doing this stuff with Adam. So we but we were in early, like super early, and it and it's like it reminds me of the time uh, when I got into computers. Um, I got into computers seriously in 1976 and I went to the first uh, West Coast Computer Fair and I was, I was all jacked up about computers and it all stemmed from the, um, everything in personal computing stemmed from a 1975 article in Popular Electronics, which had it highlighted the, uh, one of the computers, the, uh, I think it was the Altair. The Altair was on the cover, and then they talked about personal computing. And so a year had gone by before I had f- f- caught on to personal computers. And after, a, and I looked back on, it, I said, a year has gone by, and I said to myself, "Holy mackerel, am I late on this? I've blown it. You know, a year has <laughs> gone by, and I'm way behind. I'm a year behind." Well, uh, that's an attitude you can take if you look at it objectively. We've been doing it for 16 years, going on 17 for the No Agenda Show. It's in its infancy, as far as I can tell. I mean, yeah, there's 4 million podcasts and everybody's trying to do it and everyone wants to do it, but it hasn't settled down in any way, shape, or form. And it is a, a kind of a technology that is pushing is pushing the mainstream media a little bit because if you look at the stats of, of people trusting mainstream media, and especially in the United States, when it's only owned by two or three corporate three corporations or so, um, and they push the same agenda and do the same stories, which we mock on this on our show. Uh, the public is looking for other outlets for for news analysis, in particular, instead of the stuff that they're getting on TV, surrounded by advertisements for for um, pharma. Mostly, they they big pharma has captured literally captured the media since they were allowed to advertise prescription drugs beginning around 1983 and they are the ones calling the shots so you can't uh, you know if they tell you you know once you go out and plug some uh, rsv vaccine we just gave, came up with it plug it a lot in your shows you know they they kowtow to whatever the pharma guys want we we can't put up with that so especially with vivek now and and bobby the op saying that podcasting is going to 
be the way they go. I mean, that's some pretty big name guys like saying that we have to spend more time on podcasts. I mean, that's what people are, are wanting. So, well, they have to spend more time on podcasting because the mainstream media, especially with Bobby, the op, uh, the mainstream media is not, uh, amenable to having them on at all so luckily there is podcasting they can fall back on and the audience is pretty damn big i mean joe rogan probably has a 10 million people that listen to his show daily and that's a lot more than any of these uh cable tv uh, networks they have two million people you know at the most uh you have the MSNBC folks. They once in a while they'll pop over a million, but most of the time it's between three hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand, which is uh, it's just considering all the money that goes into those productions is not that many. Well, what's the Super Bowl even? I mean, Rogan's doing like oh, the Super, Super Bowl is like twenty, thirty, thirty million, something like yeah, that. Yeah, so 30. he's doing two Super Bowls a week. Yeah, yeah, it's it, he, yeah, it's pretty astonishing actually. I tend to agree with that infancy thing. I mean, there is a 4 million. I mean, I bet you 3 million of them don't get past episode 10. I mean, I forget what the stat was years ago, but it was was something like 70 some percent of podcasts never get to the 10th episode. It's funny because we had a buddy who started a show and he he quit on seven, which I think was the number that they said was the average number that. Yeah, they they can't do it. Most shows quit on. It's not easy to go 10. I mean, we've only been doing it 10. We did it when we started. I think I want to say it was inside the first year. We actually went on some other podcast that is now defunct. And they mentioned we hadn't come up with a monetization model yet. We didn't know what we were going to do. We had just figured out that there was some real expenses to podcasting, not just including the time, the, the hosting was going out. You know, there's all these little expenses that you don't expect. And all of a sudden the show was costing us, you know, a few hundred dollars a month. And we were discussing how to monetize it. We went on some show and it was after the show. They're like, you guys got to check out this no agenda show. I see they're doing this value for value thing. I want to say you guys were on like episode 600 or 600 and something at the time. And we've been kind of along for the ride the whole way. We ended up instituting that value for value model. But I, I tend to agree. I really think like I was telling Graham the other day, I was like, we, you know, we've made it through the dry period. In my estimation, I mean, maybe we're still in it, but I feel like there was this this weird oversaturation period where everybody's asking for money and you're one of those people asking for money, but they're listening <laughs> to 10 people asking for money. Yes. Plus, a lot of them are still on cable and this and that and the other, but that's going to settle down with the people that can hack it. Um, are already having a share of the market before a lot of these shows are starting that. That plays a role. And I don't know if you agree with this, but I feel like the pendulum is coming back to where, you know, shows like ours aren't going to be shadow banned as heavily as they are right now. Oh, uh, <clears throat> that's hard to say. I mean, we never dealt with that because we do our own thing. Literally, we have our own infrastructure. We have our own servers. We do. We we serve the show to people internationally from usually from servers that are in Canada and Europe. And so we don't worry about any of that. We watch it and we say, oh, that could happen to, you know, if we were going in that direction, that could happen to us. And so we've always been, we've always shied away from being on a platform that we don't control. And so, so we, so we didn't pay, uh, we still don't seriously pay much attention to people that get, shadow band or band i mean i have a twitter account that uh is obviously on some st- still i talked this over with one of the other twitter people that uh erin elizabeth in fact uh because we we've lamented that the two of us have it appears to be a a um ceiling to the number of followers we can have and even when Elon Musk took over, that hasn't changed. And I've concluded that that was because there was a piece of code put in there where you gave, here's a, this guy can't have more than this many followers. And here's how they hard coded it in the system. And when Musk came and fires half the people, nobody knows how to undo that. That's my theory about the, about the ceiling, which won't seem to go in. Mine is a 101.9. 
without yeah. manually going into each one. Somebody's got to go in manually and adjust that or something. To, to if your they can even do that, I'm I can't get Elon kicked me the fuck off, and I can't get back on, and I can't even. I'll email him. I've I've appealed him probably literally two hundred times now. I've tried. Yeah, you're gonna have to get somebody else to do it for you. Yeah, because I'm trying to get some sort of like. Oh, that's interesting. I'm stuck in this jar that I can't get out of. Yeah, you gotta find somebody outside to do it for you. Yeah, because within 30 minutes, I get this auto reply that says, "Now you you broke the rules, man. You're out. You broke the rules. You're out. You broke the rules." What rules did you break? I told him he's gonna love this. I told a politician that if she kept getting boosters, she it was Rachel Notley who just retired. Yeah. I told her, you know, she was the the NDP, the communist leader the leader of the communist party in Alberta. And she kept talking about boosters, 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 boosters. This was after, you know, people were having trouble after the shots, you know, there's clear yeah, evidence. Yeah, too many boosters and you're dead. Yeah, exactly. So I said, <laughs> she said she was going to tell them people to keep getting boosters. And I was like, you're going to keep getting these boosters. And why do you keep getting up. boosters? The shot doesn't work and the boosters don't work. Why do you keep getting in them? So I insinuated she was going to stroke out if she kept getting boosters. And that's what they kicked Oh, me you said, oh, she's going to stroke out. Mm. He just yeah, said, yeah, until, yeah, you, until you stroke out. I mean, so it wasn't a threat. Yeah. It was just. But I'll tell you, people are way worse on there now. And Darren, Darren, what Darren did is mild compared to the people that are pushing back on the Canadian politicians now. So it's just Darren. I think that's great advice, Darren. You got to get somebody else to apply. Somebody, to yeah, yeah, if Elon got wind of this, he would just put you right back on. I mean, he doesn't seem like. I mean, that's what I think. Uh, people don't. Some people don't like him. I think he's he's funny guy and uh, means well and. Uh, He's an exploitative type of person because that's why he does so well by, you know, selling electric cars and getting government money. And he really knows how to get government money. Uh, the Twitter thing has probably hurt his bottom line and hurt his uh, net worth somewhat because I, I don't believe he bought Twitter for $44 billion. I think he, he got money from others and they all put it together and they bought it for some amount of money. I don't know if it was 44 or whatever, uh, but... It's not looking good. Would the banks be involved in a deal that big? Like, cause I just read Trump's books. Um, I'd read the, but he's always talking about, I mean, he's buying all this stuff and it's like almost all financing. With the oh yeah. But he's, a, yeah, but, he, but Trump's a real estate guy and a builder. And so the banks are always in on that. Uh, Elon comes out of Silicon Valley and that is a different mentality. And these are people that know how to get into other people's wallets, which are, often fatter than a bank wallet with less with less uh, strings attached. So I don't think banks are involved at all. So what did do you, do you want to build on that Darren or no, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good strategy. I've been busting Elon's balls pretty hard over the, uh, I mean, I do use his internet now that I'm out in the country. I don't really have, there's not really another viable choice. The Starlink, I will say the Starlink works pretty good. Are you I mean, on it now? Yeah, I'm on it right now. And I was having problems um, with it. Seemed like it was cycling once in a while, but I got, I just got a separate one. Cause if I just like get the kids off of it when I'm doing a show, I don't have any problems. And now I, I took it off of the Wi Fi. I figured out that on my computer, because my Mac mini isn't smart enough for me to turn the Wi Fi on, but it's also hardwired. So it's not, doesn't seem smart enough to use the hardwire if the Wi Fi is on at all. So I've shut the Wi-Fi off, and I just don't let the kids on the internet while I'm recording. I've ordered a separate Starlink that I can hook up just for my office. But, yeah, I got to say, overall, other than uploading, which can be a bit of a pain, I've been extremely satisfied with the Starlink. Well, Adam has, and we tried using it a couple of times, and we had a latency issue because our latency, we use clean feed out of England. And our latency is pretty much nil. Usually, unless some, there's some something going on in the net, but it was not giving us the, the snappiness we wanted. Uh, but I guess it gives you enough snappiness, so it's not an issue. So that's good to know. So far, so good. And I didn't even go up to the um, like there's a there's a preferred business. or a platinum or a business or something like that. I'm just on the regular residential. I'm getting about 200, 100, 100 to 200 down and about 10 to 20 up. 
But the other thing that I'm sure is a huge difference is I'm in the middle of Alberta. There's like four million people here, two and a half million of them are in the cities. So how, there's probably not a lot of Starlink usage compared to well, that could be. Texas. There might be a lot more users I, trying to beam up. Have you watched the videos on the Starlink, uh, re, the antenna that you have and how it works? This is the most fascinating thing. I, it's almost unimaginable this technology that he uh, glommed onto to put this thing together. It's pretty astonishing because those satellites are not stationary. They're just moving around like crazy. And this, and it's that antenna you've had. There's a couple of videos on YouTube that d- describe it in great detail. And it's like a jaw dropper. I but honestly, the show has been, a because th- I lived in the, I lived on an acreage uh, before I got divorced. Um, and we had to rent a place in town. To, we had to rent a little office to do the show because at that time there was just, there was no real, and this was only six years ago, there was no real rural internet technology that was going to do it. There was a satellite thing. It was still a satellite thing. It was like exploring. Yeah, the, the old satellites are impossible. Yeah, as soon as the wind picked up or it starts raining, it's not working. And then there's like a giant latency issue all the time where the only thing that really works well is Netflix which I still don't understand how they managed to make that work all the time. But uh, I'll, overall, I got to say, I'm pretty impressed with, with Elon's thing here because, I mean, I'm in the... Now, I'd imagine he'd fall into the same rules as... Would he be susceptible to the internet rules for the rest of the Canadian providers? Because I do feel like in some ways I trust Elon more than anyone else in Canada with my internet connection. Well, so you would know better than me. I don't know. We don't. They don't really tell us that sort of things around here. I don't know. It's getting weird up in Canada, though. Yeah. Uh, well, you got your Trudeau guy. That's the problem. <laughs> just a simple fix. Just vote him out. I don't understand why the Canadians put up with that guy. No, I, they, it wouldn't have been any different during COVID. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered who was in power during that time. Well, probably. Well, we saw the same thing here. COVID was a fantastic. Uh, I don't want to sit call it a psyop or anything but it was fan- well done yeah definitely. locked everybody up told them what to do they follow the orders they put the masks on they got shot 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 the shot didn't work so let's get another shot let's get oh there's a variant so let's get a new shot and they're still selling the shots even though they're not being picked up much i think the pickup on the new shot is like 10 percent, maybe yeah. something like that some low number it's, it's embarrassing the public is getting a clue, and it's podcasters that are giving them the clue. I think the podcasters sow the seeds of doubt. I would agree with that for sure. You have We've been kicked early. off everywhere. I mean, it's crazy. We even got kicked off a of Kindle. Of what? I got I, I, I got kicked off a of Kindle, which resulted in me uh, in us getting kicked off a of Kindle. Kicked off a of Kindle. I've I've had Why'd and you then get kicked had, off a of Kindle. How did they kick you off? They the just Kindle? kicked you off for crazy stuff, and you can't even talk to real people. They, they this was so the no, last one. None of these companies, yeah, high tech has done the job on uh, avoiding actual customer service. I think the last company that knew how, what they were doing with customer service was a Utah-based company that did Word Perfect, and their whole thing was office offices full of of people that would take calls. And then somebody realized, I think it was that Google realized it. Yeah, all these main companies realized it. Uh, that that what? Why? So what if they they're angry and they want to call us? Screw it. So the last time was for uh, like copyright infringement stuff, and I sent them everything to prove that there was no copyright infringement. And if there's anything that was, it's it's out of date. It's anyway. on Kindle. So every yeah, and everything's in the public domain. It's like no, 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 they. They kick you off, and it's just the same response every time. So in, every instead time. of saying no, AI. Instead of saying no, you can't do this, and you go back and forth with. Re, they just shut you down, like they close your. Yeah, account. it's easier, and they and don't have a phone it. number, so there's no phone in people. So I've you try an email, you try an email, try an email, and then you're like, you know, screw it, I'll just start a new account. Oh no, we closed that down account because we know it's you, and you're not allowed to have two accounts. <laughs> yeah, That's they, a break they, in the rules they, too. They got that part down they got that um, part down pat which wasn't even a big deal for us because it's kindle you're not making any money on kindle but this was like our entryway into our whole audiobook thing where we were you know making uh, a little and that then you know 
Oh, you well, guys are four up. months later. Hey. They're like, hey, if you can't have a Kindle account, you can't have a, an Audible account either. So you're kicked out of here too. We'll see you later. Well, I didn't know you guys. I didn't know I was on such a controversial podcast. <laughs> there could be trouble for you. I've done the show before. Nobody called me and said, hey, don't do those shows anymore with those guys. Those guys are, are subversives. <laughs> well, do, you have any, do you have any advice for other podcasters at all while we're still on that topic? Well, you guys should retire immediately. <laughs> You're just under under you're under a barrage of of hate threats. You name it. I don't know. It's terrible. Well, Maybe yeah, that's what happens these days when you're when you're looking for the truth. When you're deconstructing the news, you know. Well, yeah. No, I have no advice for podcasters. I, my my advice is all well. I do have some, and, and since I'm I can yak as much as I want on this show. Um, my advice is that. Provide the audience with something distinctive, somewhat entertaining if you can, and something they can't get any place else. That's the main one. Uh, it has to be something they can't get any place else. It's either some sort of information or or personalities that are people think are great or whatever. Uh, that's how you are successful. Most podcasts, because I listen to podcasts. Most podcasts are um, regurgitated uh, Democrat talking points. It seems to me, or or worse, they're just they're just or guys are just shooting the shit like you would get at you know at a bowling alley. Uh, that's then they're not interesting. Uh, I mean, our podcast, even though it's produced on the fly as a as kind of performance art changes the topic once in a while I mean, we we do a topic for 10 minutes we think we, we've overdone it i've listened to podcasts where they'll, they'll take one subject that we might do for 10 minutes and they'll spend an hour and a half hashing it over oh and they talk about it and over and you know there's another thing is fox news is a good example of doing this in a different way fox i was sorry i not a big fox a fan but i do like a couple of shows and i like gutfeld quite a bit because i think it's well written and uh and its structure is new it's a new sort of of structure but if you listen to fox you say you spend a day listening to fox show after show after show after show they'll revisit the same 10 topics each show will revisit the exact same 10 topics and when you get to gutfeld they're doing the same topics usually not 10 of them, but they're doing the top five topics with a humorous bent, but it's the same exact topics. And these podcasters that have these, this idea that they can hash over one topic for an hour and a half and keep people interested. Uh, it's impossible. I don't know what they're thinking. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your process and, and let's say like, Let's say we were going to do a, a show like yours, kind of like your like. Can you talk about your sort of your clipping and your process of your deconstruction process of what you and Adam do? Well, there's a couple of things that are. It's hard to do, uh, for other people to do what we do because we kind of got into a. We're both skeptical, but in a from a completely different perspective. His perspective is is. Uh, it's just different than mine. He has a different way of looking at things that I do. And we both, but we can both see bullshit, but we see it slightly differently. So we can, one of us can see bullshit and the other one can say, well, that's bullshit, but this is the real bullshit. And then we show, you know, that kind of one upsmanship thing we do all the time. It's just a cool, it's just a fluke. Uh, the two of us have got, got together in the first place. And it, ter <laughs> it turns out that we work well as a team but the process is pretty similar. We we spend all day looking at news and then we clip stuff that we think is interesting or or I like to clip stuff that I think is like fraudulent reporting, which is easy to do. Uh, and Adam does pretty much the same thing. We both have people that feed us stuff. And uh, then we have to go over that. We have to be careful about that because you can get you can get caught up in some old piece. Somebody said, look at this. <laughs> it turns out to be 10 years old, uh, which is fine if you tell people it's 10 years old. 
uh, it's just, it's an almost impossible. We don't, I, like, I can't give you a, uh, a diagram uh, about the, the process because the, we do our own thing individually and then we put it together on the fly. Yeah. And it tends to work. I'd say 98% of the time there are shows that are not good and, but they're pretty rare because uh, one of us will usually have a bunch of stuff that is interesting. At least one of us will. Yeah. And uh, then we can both talk about it. I think it, it, I think Adam becoming a born again, Christian, I actually think helps the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because he was a, uh, he wasn't a born again Christian before. <laughs> yeah. If that makes any sense. But Well, yeah, I mean, he quit the weed, quit the weed and, and followed Jesus. I mean, that's quite a shift in, you know, in perspective. Yeah. Well, he, the weed he quit because he had to, because he was getting his teeth worked on and he <laughs> found his, uh, he could quit weed. He didn't, he wasn't really n- truly addicted. Uh my wife thinks he's more pleasant because he was a, but I, weed does make you a little paranoid. So you, you, you get a little snippier. Um, but I think it's the, I think the Christian thing has put him into a, uh, a, I can't, I wouldn't say a defensive posture, but he now realizes that there's a lot of anti-Christian uh, yeah. stuff out there. It's a war. There's a war on Christianity as well. I mean, there's a lot well, there's of wars. Always, but the thing, the joke to me is there's always been. Yeah. There's, it's not nothing. It's nothing but new, it's, but when you're now part of it and you're, you're caught up in it to the, that the extent. Differ- yeah. The difference you, is, you it's a lot, you, oh my God, they're trying to kill us. Exactly. And the difference is it's a lot more overt, like the satanic symbolism and music. Oh, yeah. and, it's, and I yeah. mean, now it's well, just like, you're going, holy shit, they're really putting it in our face. Yeah. Well, Adam used to always be uh, into spotting that in the music awards. Yeah. And so he would uh, watch all of them. I couldn't, I can't stand watching some of this stuff. And uh, they, they'd be basically a, a, a satanic rite being played out right on the stage in front of all the, in front of the entire audience. And he'd always point it out and who did it and why. Yeah. And I always thought it was the music. But now uh, I think he's probably a little more, uh, even more into spotting the devil's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good but, way to put uh, it. So has technology, good. has technology changed the way, like putting the people, putting the clips that you get from your listeners or your producers, they, they send you stuff. Obviously you still have to do that little bit of a vetting I do process. Most of my own clipping, so, so does, do you and Adam clip, clip them the same way? And does tech has technology recently changed the way you do your process no. at all? No, we've been clipping the same way for the last 10 years. Get them from the TV? Mostly, yeah. I mean, I have uh, YouTube TV. I mean, I used to, I would say there's some things that have changed. I used to re- uh, record directly from the TV off of a direct TV. I had a direct TV and the dish. And I plug into those things. I have some, I have pro gear. So I just recorded straight off of the uh, uh, RCA jacks and, uh, or the plugs, the little plugs. Yeah. Yeah. audio plugs and uh and then since i got uh youtube tv which has all the same stuff and i can record everything youtube tv has limitless recording so uh because they just keep everything at the home offices you're not recording anything but they make you think you are so you want to record this that and the other thing and so you get and so you you can watch tv casually and then you go to your youtube tv and pull the pull the recordings and then clip directly on the, on the computer right into, in my case, I use audacity. Uh, you, so I don't clip with a recorder anymore. I clip right into the clip maker, uh, using YouTube TV. So that changed a little bit. I, Adam's process. I have no idea what he does. (laughs) Do you think we're both sticklers about quality though? So yeah. if Adam has a echoey clip, you know, where you just picked it up with a microphone in a hotel room. No, no, that's not going to cut it. The clips we have are high quality clips that are clear and, and, and very uh, usable professional. You think you could have done the show because for a while, I mean, when you first start realizing how messed up everything is and how fraudulent and lying and terrible it is, you're like, 
oh well this must be a new thing but then it seems like maybe it isn't do you think do you think you could have done the show as easily if the technology existed in you know the 40s 50s and 60s as it is today or do you think it's more blatant and wrapping up i've come to the conclusion that what you said is true. I think in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the same. I don't think this has ever changed that much. And in fact, that's why there were newsletters that were done by I.F. Stone. And there's a guy named, you want to look up a guy who did some terrific journalism. Uh, his name is Seldes, S-E-L-D-E-S. And he was the guy who developed the first uh, newsletter, uh, public newsletter. And he sold tens of, he had a huge subscriber base. And then I have stone did the same thing. These were kind of left leaning uh, writers, but they were doing the same thing we're doing with podcasting. They were deconstructing news in the, but they put it in a newsletter and the pu public would subscribe to it. So, and so it would, so they saw the same bad reporting and, and corruption within the media that except it's not, I think the bad part today is the fact that, Big Pharma has captured a lot of media, but except for that difference, uh, it was still captured by one group or another, large corporations mostly. Uh, and uh, it's, it, yeah, we can, in other words, to answer your question, yes, if we had the same technology in 1955 and we were alive, uh, we would both be able to do the exact, this pretty much the same show, maybe even better back then, maybe better. Yeah, because there's so much skepticism out there today about the news media. You just have to look at the polls showing that nobody believes the news media, the the, the big boys, and it's there's poll after poll. It keeps showing them dropping. The Republicans are really don't believe anything. The Democrats are now way below. They're on thirty percent of uh, credibility. Back in the day, in the fifties, that those numbers would be way up there. Everyone would be very trust trusting of the news uh, yeah. media, so it would be we'd have more of a field day, I think, because right now everybody thinks everybody's full of shit, and so it's you know okay, well these guys are just pointing out the obvious. I think well, it's harder for us. It start it's starting to it seem like they're realizing that too from the clip you guys played in the last episode or two where they're. The, the lady, I think it was the New York Times or Washington Post lady in the Davo thing saying, like, we're we're losing everybody's trust. Like, nobody. Yeah, they believes. are. So they're, they're starting to realize it. I don't know if they really understand it fully, but no. they're starting to realize it. I mean, how does that, I wanted to ask you about that. One of my main questions is how you keep sort of a modicum of positivity when you when you're constantly having to review this main, these mainstream lies. Like, that's the hardest part for me to listening to your show is that's my only real mainstream my, that's my mainstream diet is, is, I mean, of course we do, you know, we do our own show and I do see like headlines, but from the actual like TV clips and the news clips, it's so hard to just hear them lying. So outright constantly, you know, and, and you guys are sort of putting all this together. Like how do you kind of keep somewhat detached from that? Not uh, cynical. Yeah. We're not detached, but we just think it's hilarious. I mean, to us, it's a form of humor. And I think we try to express that so people don't start taking this so seriously. This is the problem a lot of these podcasts have. They, they're just, you know, I could almost name a few of them. They're very, very well attended podcasts. And the guy's like, he's freaked out, you know, and he's, oh my God, they're going to do this and they're going to take over. And the next thing you know, we're all going to be slaves. We're going to have vaccine passports and they won't let you do anything because you're going to have a credit, social credit score just like they have in China. And that's what they're trying to do to us now with digital currency. And we're all going to die. And so, uh, okay, well, maybe, I mean, it's possible. I don't see it personally. I mean, Adam's trends a little bit to thinking that way, but he still thinks it's funny. And I just think it's hilarious because I don't see any evidence that any, these guys can't pull off anything. They're incompetent and it's, let alone digital currency. I mean, they had their shot here with COVID and now they can't even get anyone to take the shot, you know, the, the vaccine, I should say different types of shot there. Uh, the vaccine is, is dead in the water. And now it's created because of the skepticism that's been put out there largely by podcasters, the guys like you in particular, um, the public is like backed off from all kinds of vaccines. They're, they're rethinking all these vaccines. Is it, is it all bull crap? I mean, we played a couple of measles clips from the Brady Bunch in the last show, which was, I thought was an eye opener. It showed that the, uh, Measles was 
pretty much eradicated. I mean, it wasn't eradicated, but it became nothing more than a nuisance in the late 60s. And it never was a thing that you'd want to get a shot for. You just get it, and it was no big deal. I remember having it. And, you know, you get a rash. It's like a yeah, bad rash. School. And you got to be inside. Yeah? You got a so week I'm off sorry. school. You got a week off school. Yeah, you got a week off school. It's great. And so uh had a temperature and a rash, and you were over it, and then you never would get it again. Uh well, even the chicken pox, right? The chicken pox was even same thing. It was even less than measles. No, we like oh, you get the chicken pox, send them over to our house because you didn't want them to get it as an animal. No, they used to have parties to get people sick, but that which is kind of sick if you think about it. But it's important. <laughs> this chicken pox was actually, I think, it's the one. If you get chicken pox, I'm pretty. Oh no, mumps, mumps. If you get, if you didn't get mumps as a kid and you get it as an older male, it goes right to your balls. And you get these big swollen balls, and it's like I, I understand that to be quite painful. So um, that's something you don't want. To, that I would get it if I was an adult male, and I never had the mumps when I was a kid, which I did, and it wasn't a pleasant feeling to have these. Your glands are just swollen; and they hurt. But I'd probably get a shot just in case. I I, mean, I can't imagine having the the balls. No. Big giant basketball size and balls. No, no good. I think the other interesting stat that is going around out there now, I don't know if you guys seen that one yet, is just because during COVID, all of the wellness checkups for all the kids were canceled. So yeah. no shots, no no six month shots, no one year shots, no four month shots. And uh I wanna say SIDS went down by like forty five percent. Yeah, I know it's funny. They don't want to talk about anything like that. That's why you got banned. You be quiet. Exactly. The vaccine thing does seem to be the real reason that we got banned. Funny enough, though, since YouTube demonetized us, all we're going up. I mean, touch wood, because we're probably going to get kicked off right away. I hope we don't. But uh, they demonetized us, and everything started going up. It's like we got let out of the... It's almost like we're better being away from the advertisers, but I don't know. It's going to be short-lived. I really feel like they're letting us... No, you guys are troublemakers. Yeah, they're giving yeah. us enough leash to hang ourselves. And, and the funny thing is, you're Canadians. How can this be? <laughs> it's the no agenda effect. That's a joke from uh, for the audience that understands what I said. Yeah. So, so what? <laughs> hey, Darren, oh, okay. Yes, go on. I got a couple things I want to finish off with, Darren. But where do you have anywhere you want to go from now? No, you go ahead. You can. We, I mean, I got places to go, but you go ahead, and I'll play off of that. Well, okay, so before I I, I want to get this out there because before we, we end up out of time, but I am an, a proud nut fister, John, and and I can explain yeah. why. <laughs> there's a logic, guys. there's a logic to it. But I mean, I'm telling you, when I first heard you like you know talking about the nut fishing, I was it. like, oh my god, I'm one of those guys on the plane that you would be fucking losing your mind yeah. over. And I'm telling you, it's it's there's a there's a reason for it. You, why you see people doing this is because otherwise, if you're grabbing the nuts like this out of the bag with your fingers, and you're trying to get more than one at a time, which of course is you know normal, and you're going to put them in your mouth. I mean, they're they're pushing together, they're spraying out, they're dropping everywhere. I mean, the the most logical way is you take them, you let them sit in mm -hmm. your fist, yeah. and then you shake them into your mouth. I mean, it's I'm like the the cleanest, most yeah. logical way to eat nuts. And then now you take the nut bag you tear the whole top off and you you drop like how many nuts you want in your palm like three and you go <laughs> and you just take the three or four nuts in your mouth that way and you get some salt in your palm that's about it that's the way you eat the nuts you don't take the whole bag of nuts and drop them all the whole bag into your fist and then <laughs> shake them what is the point it seems like yeah that's what exactly what darren's it looks like you're <laughs> jacking off yeah. No, Dude, I didn't uh, say that's something you don't bag. do. Just you just don't do them, whether they're easier or not. Or I, you know what I do. Now that I think about, it, I'm trying to think what I do when I have the. I'll take the whole top of the bag of nuts off, and I just take the bag, the whole bag, and just right, down as much as I can in my mouth, and have maybe twenty. 20 peanuts in my mouth and I would chew them up. Yeah, okay, that's that's good. That, I, so, I like okay, those two okay. ways. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I, I like those two ways. That's well, really, okay. Stick with you, what you're doing because it's probably it's it's like a, people who smoke, they really just smoke just so they can have something to do with their hand. <laughs> you can do two fists, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but you have cashews and one fist and a peanuts and the other, sure. I do. Before I forget, I got to say that my uh, 
smoking hot douchebag wife says hi. Oh, Did hello I, to her. What's her name? Her name's uh, Shauna. She's a big JCD fan. Yeah, good for her. She's a smart woman. Yeah, I only had to hit her in the mouth once or twice, and she came around. Well, well you know. We the have a thing- lot of women that listen to our show that uh, enjoy it. Yeah. Because, of course, they're getting to hear two old guys, basically. I mean, Adam's not nearly as old as I am, but they get to hear two mature men. Uh, in the case, a couple of things. One, we as even at our age, we still act immature, which proves their point, because that's what women think all men are, uh, just immature idiots. And so we, we confirm that in their minds. And then we also have some insights because of our... Uh, experience that they don't get it elsewhere and so they like the show and we have a sense of humor about things speaking of uh wives um i want to get you get you to plug the the egg book oh uh, yes too many egg, egg book because Amy wrote this egg, you have a copy well, before you do yeah i would love one but before you do that because eggs has been one of those foods in the last few decades that's been through the whole gamut you know they're good for you bad for you good for you bad for you <laughs> bad for you yeah. you know and now they're well, part of the people, meat eaters. That they're part of the carnivore diet and the keto. Like now, there there's a resurgence of eggs. People yeah. people love them. Too many eggs dot com. You can get a free PDF if you want. Too many eggs dot com. Uh, and get a P- free PDF, or you, can get, or you can buy the book there. It's a big book. It's eight hundred pages of egg recipes and mostly stories. But about why did these, you, about the recipes? She has origin stories. Why did she want to write that? Sorry. Why did she want to write that? Uh, well, she has a story about how um, it was a grieving experience because her brother died and she had something needed something to do. But in fact, we had a bunch of chickens and we had too many eggs and she was looking for more and more recipes to burn through eggs. And she started writing these recipes down and the book kind of got started that way. And then she kept promising she was going to do a whole book and it took a decade, but she did it. She finally finished the, the whole thing. So it literally got lots of recipes in there. And for people that like eggs, then that would be really good. There's 800 recipes or so. <laughs> I've got, I got chicken. So I got the book uh, oh, yeah. right away as soon as it came out. Cause yeah, I have that think? problem once in a while. I mean, in the winter, we don't have too many eggs, but in the summer we do. So I knew exactly what you're talking about when everyone was freaking about, about eggs. It's like, well, yeah, they don't really lay eggs in the winter. Yeah, it's it's amazing when you have a few chickens and they, all, all the eggs start accumulating. It's like, what do we do with all these eggs? We've got chicken, so we can get some nice fresh eggs, but we didn't expect to get this many. And the chickens don't care, so they're laying eggs all over the place. I mean, they don't lay in one spot necessarily. They should. Some t- chickens are, are good about that, but most of them just lay an egg when they feel like it. So you're stepping out in the yard, you're stepping one. Um so we, yeah, too many eggs. It's a good book. It's a it's a classic. So what makes you think Bobby is an op? Uh, so we're talking about RFK Jr. I mean, I, that is one thing that really interests me personally on on why you guys because you guys are very different in what you think is op. Sometimes Adam thinks something's an op, and sometimes you're calling things ops. But you both seem to agree that Bobby is an op, and yeah, and I know there's some some obvious things there, but he's been pushing back. On Fauci and the right. vaccines, this, this pretty hard. Works right? for the CIA. You think that might have something to do with it, or who does? Who does? His sister, I think, is his sister-in-law. Oh. Works for the CIA, and she's become his campaign manager. I think she's taken over from Dennis Kucinich, and she's an agent. I mean, oh, she's retired, but she wrote a book on it. And um, I mean, I had a joke with Adam once. I said, "Well, it was a the CIA is pushing him to be president as a make good for killing his." brother and or his son is his father and his his his, uh, his uncle. Uncle. uncle but he uh but i've never believed that the cia killed uh john f kennedy i i into the mafia thesis that was brought up by ex-mobsters and it's not it makes more sense but uh and i've never been totally convinced that uh the cia killed robert f kennedy either but that one it, I could be convinced otherwise. Uh, so I mean, that was just a joke, though. So, you know, he's he would be an interesting guy as president because of his anti-pharma. He would maybe eliminate pharma advertising on TV, which would be great. And some other things that are going on, he would probably get rid of that. But he's still a Democrat that's 
you know, environmental nutcase. Uh, he's they've toned it down a bit. Uh, I, it just seemed like an op, and I think it's still an op, and I think it's an op to take votes away from Trump the way it's set up. Because I don't think he's going to take votes away from any uh, Democrat. The Democrats are wearing masks to this day, <laughs> and they're you know getting boosters over and over. And, well, that, and Bobby yeah. is an anti-vaxxer by their definition. He, they're not going to vote for him. Which is missing, like what Adam says too. There's a there's a group, a core group of Trump supporters that don't like his stance on the the warp speed, and there is a bunch of anti vaxxers that used to be Trump voters that probably need somewhere to go, and and that might be that. Yeah, I, mean, I, think I can so see too. that. Yeah, and Trump has not taken uh, uh taken a uh an apology a hard enough stance for yeah. his vax thing, and he still brags about how that happened so fast, even though it was obviously a setup of some sort. And then he was like burned with his uh, commentary about different kinds of treatments. Um, what was that one? Uh, I can't remember, but this, before Ivermectin showed up, there was another one. That he kept, hydroxychloroquine? Or? Hydroxychloroquine. He promoted that. And next thing you know, they came down hard on him. The guy is a target, you know, and it's like I, people can, I can see people not voting for him. Yeah. So what's the future for No Agenda? I don't know. We keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It seems I mean, it's not, it seems to me we have a, a, a core audience that likes the show. Yeah. And they, they, they like us and they like what we're doing. And as long yeah. as that continues, you know, we'll keep doing it. It's, it's a, it's fun. It's actually semi fun. And I get to come on shows like this, which is a, the, one of the great subversive shows uh, ever created <laughs> in Canada. Hey. 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 In Canada, what are your favorite podcasts? What are you listening to regularly? Uh, I don't really listen to anything regularly. I would say, um, I will say, there's a couple of podcasts I admire. The podcaster, uh, for reasons that make no sense, I'm not going to. I shouldn't even be plugging them. And uh, I can't. I can't give you a. a I should probably think about it, but I don't listen to any podcast regularly. I kind of yeah. listen to all of them casually and yeah. occasionally I'll get guided to one. And I mean, if I, if I hear uh, something comes out from uh, uh, the, the amazing Polly, for example, if she produces something, I'll definitely go get it. Uh, Mr. Reagan, I find to be entertaining, uh, but I don't watch him regularly or, or listen to him. Uh, there used to be a thing called the Truth Machine or the Truth Factory with a oh, cat. Oh yeah, she, she was up yeah, up north of us. Yeah, yeah, the cat, the talking cat. And I guess she's just not producing stuff anymore. She stopped or she's on a hiatus. I don't know. I like that product a lot, and um, I like people who go and I like the ones who do work, not just sit around shooting the shit. I mean, I I can see people liking guys shooting the shit, but. I like to see something where I'm going, I haven't heard this. This is news to me. And they do a lot of research and they bring it out. That's what does that. that and yeah. the truth factory used to do that. We're kind of doing that. And we have another show, Grime America Outlawed, which is a little more controversial and all that, even than this one. And we're doing our own sort of round. We call it a roundup where we're, we're kind of doing similar. We're trying to do similar stuff where talk about some of the stuff that doesn't get talked about, do some deconstruction and, we, cause we don't really have a chance to just chit chat ourselves cause everything's interview based. So this is kind of more just us going through it for, you know, an hour and a half well, different, it different be a topics. So I'll check it out. Yeah. And thanks. with some Canadian spin, the, I mean, the, oh, yeah. Yeah. the, uh, the truth cat was a shitty one because she went and when we talked to her, she had just like quit her day job and everything was going well. And then I think YouTube smoked her and all of a sudden all of her income was gone. Yeah, the amazing, I think they happened to Amazing Polly, but she moved on to uh, Rumble. Yeah. yeah. Rumble and Bitchy, it was hard to bring your YouTube audience. So, I mean, yeah, one I think thing it's you impossible. Know, it's almost impossible to move your audience from one yeah, well, platform to another. That's a shame what happened to the Truth Factory because that was a quality product. Yeah. Quality I, product. I want to have Amazing Polly on uh, on our other show. I, we've, uh, I should try again to get a hold of her. It's, it's hard. She's hard to get a hold of. Uh, yeah, from that kind of perspective. Hard to get, I'm hard to get a hold of, basically. Yeah. Especially now that I'm banned from Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was my main avenue for getting a hold of people. You're banned because from we Twitter? Had, like, 
I've never heard such a thing. <laughs> yeah, we had like 50,000 followers. So, you know, not that it really matters, but when you approach some of these people, it, it gave you a little bit of credibility. You know, you're not just, you, you, you look like something, but now it's like you're sending them emails and a million other people are sending them emails. No, just keep plugging. Just yeah. keep plugging. Yeah. That's what we've been doing for 10 years. We ain't going to stop get now. A, get a booker. Have you, uh, before we let you go, do you, can you give us some predictions for 2024? Uh, yeah, I think the economy is going to do better than people think. Uh, it's a good time to sell your art. If you got art to sell, uh, there'd be a, I think that everyone's going to be jacked up. Um, I think the, the immigration thing is not going to be helped at all by anything going on. The Dem the Republicans are going to be ineffectual at doing their investigations. I think that's going to continue. Hunter Biden is going to smell like a rose coming out of this. That if Biden gets kicked out of office, he's just going to pardon Hunter for everything he ever did and his brother probably too. And so that's, so that's a meaningless waste of time. Uh, Trudeau will continue to screw up Canada as best he can and try to socialize everything. And, uh, but that'll get reversed eventually because the Canadians are not, you know, they, I've always said the reason the difference between the Canadians and the Americans is that we had a revolution, uh, to, to get our freedom. The Canadians just complained a lot. And so, uh, the Canadian complaining is a very powerful tool and they do it better than anybody. And I think at this point they're going to start, uh, complaining more about Trudeau and maybe getting some results. And I tend to agree. I, I'm expecting to see him resign by the end of the year. <laughs> oh, that's optimistic. Or maybe not, if not resign, at least I, I think if he don't resign, which he might want to do to save face, but I think the party's had enough of him. Oh, they better have. Right? Because eventually he's not just ruining Trudeau. He's ruining the whole liberal party brand that they've spent a hundred <laughs> years building, you know? John, do you know how much they spent in 2022 on, on uh, consultants? You, you will know ex you will know exactly who the consultants are, but how much do you think Trudeau spent? Oh, I'd say uh, two hundred fifty million. Yeah, seventeen point three or seventeen point seven billion. No. Yes, apparently, according I to the National Post, because I didn't believe him, and it was in our fucking. I don't believe him and, now. Yeah. Seventeen. What? Holy mackerel! You I mean, buy, it, why don't you just buy votes? Send everybody's a ten dollar bill. You'd get him voted in. <laughs> that would be, no, be more. I wonder how much that would be for the measly 35 million of us in Canada. Now, but that's what I do. So, um, yeah, and you know who it was because you talk about him a lot, McKinsey and company. Oh, that's McKinsey, it. yeah. Well, of course. Well, they, they'll work for anybody. That's a bonanza, <laughs> by the way, for them, not for oh, yeah. so much for So that's that you're talking about that that's Canadian taxpayer money. It's not coming out of his wallet. No, that's coming out of our taxes. Or they're yeah, just you, printing it. You're paying for it. Well, they're, they seem to be just printing it, which makes me getting taxed seem weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the point? John, this has been fantastic. As always, thank you for your courage. We've been, I mean, grams a night. I'm not quite there yet. I think I got halfway to go. I should, I should clean that up. But, you know, we are, uh, you guys are the only podcast that I listen to regularly. So. Well, that's nice. I, we appreciate that. Of course. And we like coming on this show and, uh, Adam will be on next. Adam will be on next. Yep. Thank you, John, for all you do. Come back anytime. Thank Stay you. safe. You guys. Adios. And that was a chat with the one and only John C. Dvorak. Everyone's oh, loving man, it. What do you think? Oh, yeah. The people in the chat were just loving it, too. I mean, like, yeah, he's he's got everybody loves him. I, I kind of uh, I see it now. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I always have, but it's just good to see him physically again. You know, he looks like a, you know what? He looks harder than I remembered. Totally. He looks harder yeah. than you. He's like yeah. 30 years older than you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I told him that. I, when we were in there before you came in, I was like, you look good, John. You're looking good. Like he's just got that like ruggedness about him that I. That well, I, I was, remember. I was late. Cause I had almost resigned to the fact that it wasn't going to happen. Oh, right. But it was right. Like you said, I was like, no, nah, no, nah, he's not going to confirm. He's just going to show up five yeah. minutes before and be like, let's go. Where's my link. <laughs> and you know, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, he's so, an old it, pro that way because he's got it. You know, he made the booking. He's an old pro. He's going to show up. He is an old, old pro. Absolutely. Big thanks to John C. Dvorak for coming on the show. 
Big thanks to you guys for listening. Uh, Adam is not on tonight. Adam is on on February 19th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. February 19th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. If you guys want to catch that one live, of course, it'll come out uh, later as well, post-produced. Um, well, not we don't really do much production. Anyway, big thanks to John for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks if you're one of the choose, few people who do choose to support the work. You know, take a little uh, a lesson from John's book here and say, you guys need to do a better job of supporting this show. I mean, it's at an all-time low for the 10 years we've been doing the show. If it weren't for the Grand America Outlawed show and the audiobooks, we'd be broke because uh, I can tell you there's there's probably less than 200 people supporting this show at any level right now. And, you know, a lot of those are a buck or two bucks a month. So, you know, it's barely sustainable to keep this show going. The fact that we love it. We love talking to you guys. We love interviewing people like John. But uh, we could use some support if you're getting some value from our little podcast here. And you want to send some value back our way, you can do so at grimerica.ca slash support. You can do a one-time donation of any amount you like. You can sign up for a monthly of any amount you like. There's a Stripe option there if you don't like PayPal. A lot of people quit PayPal and never came back to any other platform during the PayPal apocalypse. And uh, we got other stuff. There is the Patreon as well. There's the locals. Uh, we don't know what probably pay, we don't really know how well locals works yet. Patreon always seems to work. The best though is uh, GrimericaOutlaw.ca or GrimericaOutlaw.ca slash support because those ones are direct to us. There's no sort of intermediary that's taken an extra cut or that can kick us off. I mean, I guess PayPal and these other places always could too, but it seems less likely. Those guys would get in trouble before we did, maybe. I don't know. We do go a little third and fourth rail sometimes. Anyway, that's about it. GrimericaOutlaw.ca for that other podcast we're talking about where we do do the roundup style stuff that is a little No Agenda-esque, not quite as polished, and with a little more Canadian and a lot more like second half of show stuff like no Jen used to do back in the day. Um, adultbrain.ca for all the audiobooks. We have the audiobook podcast, probably one of the biggest audiobook podcasts in the world by book volume. And uh, contact at the cabin for the trips. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Teach me all your secrets to get a good handle on a better way. Does one get out of bed every day in the throes of the apocalypse? Should I bury my head in the sand or sabotage their evil plan? I feel really trapped, an ant burned by a magnifying glass. It's all a little bit too convenient, all the evidence went up in flames. Phonies, fraudsters, scammers belong in the slammer. My friend, best give up their names. Should I call on militia men or pass out a petition pen? I feel really trapped. An ant burned by a magnifying glass. I don't know what y'all been told, but I got a soul made out of gold. Sound off. One, two, sound off. Three, four, cadence count. One, two, a big ball. Some time ago, a crazy dream came to me. I dreamt I was walking into World War Three. As prophetic as humanity, as aching bones, as frantic animals. Sophia wrote it down, built an ark. Now she floats it down a river in the dark. down a river dark I can't even hear my own thoughts for the life of me over the din of a bruised and broken culture the media spins and splatters and spins and clatters and I cringe because it's psychological warfare don't you feel yourself getting really mad how did we let it get this bad don't you feel really trapped like a brain in a vat Hard 
to close Pandora's box But sirens are singing me off a cliff I'm looking to hitchhike to Shangri-La over yonder Sophia, would you give me a lift? Hopped out of the Hegelian Rebellion Say goodbye to all you Machiavellians Let evil destroy itself I'm bound for Shangri-La Shangri-La I'll let you be in my dream if I could be in yours. I'll let you be in my dream if I could be in yours. That's prophetic as morning does, as groundhogs, as falling stars above. Sophia wrote it down, built an ark, now we're floating it down a river dark. As prophetic. Above a river bright Shangri-La